1889, Benjamin Harrison was president. North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, and Washington all became states. In France, the Eiffel Tower became the tallest man-made structure in the world, and Vincent van Gogh painted Starry Night. The first all-American football team was chosen by Walter Kemp. And America's favorite newspaper writer, Nellie Bly, set off on an around-the-world trip to beat the time set by Phileas Fogg in Jules Verne's book, Around the World in 80 Days. Nellie Bly was born in 1864. Her real name was Elizabeth Jane Cochran, and everybody called her Pink, because her mother always dressed her in pink. Pink Cochran grew up near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and she got her first newspaper job in Pittsburgh when she was 21. Shamise, Dwayne, how did she get the name Nellie Bly? Nellie Bly was a song by Stephen Foster. Dwayne, why don't you sing it for us? Hi, Nellie, oh, Nellie, listen a lot to me. I'll play for you, I'll sing for you a dulcet melody. Very good. Stephen Foster was also from Pittsburgh, and when Pink went to work at the Pittsburgh newspaper, The Dispatch, the guys in the newsroom thought Nellie Bly would be a good name for her. From then on, she wrote under the name Nellie Bly, and she wrote about the working girls in Pittsburgh factories. She became their hero. Nobody had cared much about them before. Nellie made them real people. But Pittsburgh wasn't a big enough town for Nellie Bly. She wanted a lot more. She wanted to be in New York City working on one of the biggest papers in the country. Nellie went to the very top paper, The World, which was Joseph Pulitzer's paper. Don't tell me she expected Pulitzer to hire her right off the train from Pittsburgh. No, but she was crafty. She used her credentials as a writer for her Pittsburgh paper to get into the offices and interview the editors of all the big papers. And guess what her topic was? Women in the newspaper business. All the editors told her pretty much the same thing, that women were not cut out for the real work of newspapers because they couldn't be sent out to cover rapes, murders, riots, and disasters. It was too dangerous. Women could only work on the society pages of the papers, covering fashion shows, art exhibits, and charity balls. Nellie wrote down exactly what all those men told her, and she sent it off to her Pittsburgh paper where it was published. Other papers reprinted the article. Soon there were letters from women all over the country offended by the editor's opinions. Nellie scored big time with that article. She went to see Colonel Don Cockrell, who was the editor of the world. She told him she had an idea for a great story. What if the newspaper paid to send her to Europe? There she would get on a boat full of immigrants in steerage class and write about their trip across the Atlantic to America. He gave her $25 to keep her idea to herself, while he talked it over with Mr. Pulitzer, his boss. Mr. Pulitzer thought it was too dangerous. He didn't like it, not for a new reporter. But get this, he suggested something even more dangerous, that Nellie change her identity, pretend to go crazy, and get herself committed to an insane asylum right there in New York City. Then he wanted her to write about what went on inside. Yeah. But don't you think that he was just trying to get rid of her by asking her to do something that he knew she would refuse to do? That's certainly what I thought when I read it. If he thought she'd back out, he was wrong. She said, okay, she'd do it. Yeah, you really have to hand it to Nellie. Either she didn't know what she was getting into or she had incredible confidence in herself. It was September of 1887. The men at the paper set it all up. Nellie would become Nellie Brown, a crazy person. She would then get herself sent to Blackwell's Island, an asylum for the insane where many people said terrible things went on. After 10 days, a man named Peter Hendricks would come and get her out. She knew all sorts of bad things could happen to her, but she did it anyway. First, she decided she would pass herself off as a Cuban woman named Nellie Moreno. Moreno is a Spanish word for brown. She would use a thick Spanish accent. She practiced with a mirror to look crazy. She decided on a far away gaze. No blitzy screaming and kicking, just kind of a zoned out lost look. She went to a rooming house on 2nd Avenue and rented a room as Nellie Moreno. She didn't wash or comb her hair. She stayed up all night, laughing and crying in her room. She knew she was keeping all the other women awake, and the next morning she acted dazed at breakfast. 
She kept saying things that didn't make any sense until two policemen arrived and took her to the station. At the station, she pretended to lose her memory. All she would say was, I can't remember. I can't remember anything. A judge there felt sorry for her and called in reporters. He gave them a description of this Nellie Moreno. Pretty, five feet five inches tall, 112 pounds, size two and a half shoe. He hoped they could run a description in the papers and find one of her friends or relatives who would come and get her. But nobody came. Nellie was sent to Blackwell's Island. At the asylum, she had to share bath towels with other inmates who had open sores. She saw female wardens choke and beat patients. She ate bad food and had to take cold baths. But most of all, she found several women who were not insane. They were immigrants who couldn't speak English and couldn't make themselves understood. They certainly didn't belong in an insane asylum. After 10 days, Mr. Hendricks came and got her and took her home. She wrote about everything she had seen, and it resulted in a shakeup at Blackwell's Island. The city appropriated an extra million dollars to improve conditions at the asylum. Nellie's story went all over North America. Newspapers praised her bravery. By then, she'd gotten the reputation of being a stunt reporter. Her next big stunt was the one that really made her famous, her trip around the world. I understand it was something a man was supposed to do, but Nellie got there first. That's right. For several months, the editors at Nellie's newspaper had been secretly talking about sending a man around the world. Do you know Jules Verne's popular book, Around the World in 80 Days? Yeah, I remember uh, Phileas Fogg and his hot air balloon. Wasn't that all based on a bet? Yes, that was the whole thing. And that's what Joseph Pulitzer had in mind. He was always dreaming up ways to sell newspapers. In six years, he had made the world the best-selling paper in New York. He knew if he sent a man around the world to beat a record, people would place bets and they would need the newspaper to tell them where the man was each day. But Nellie convinced him that people would be even more excited about a woman. A woman traveling all alone in 1889, that was unheard of. All kinds of terrible things could happen to her. So Pulitzer gave her three days to get ready. She had 72 hours to put together everything she would need for the next two and a half months. They were going to try to do the world in 75 days to beat Phileas Fogg's record by five days. And it all had to be kept a secret. If one of the other newspapers found out what Pulitzer was doing, they might beat him to the punch and send one of their guys off before she left. Nellie worked fast. She put together two dresses, a coat, and a hat. That was it. She got it all into one small bag and went aboard the steamship, the Augusta Victoria. It sailed on November 14, 1889. In six days and 21 hours, she was in England. Let me show the route she was taking because there would be several ships and trains. First, she had to cross the Atlantic Ocean to England. And then from England, she had to cross the English Channel through France and Italy, then across the Mediterranean to Egypt, then down the Suez Canal to the Gulf of Aden. And from there, she went to Sri Lanka, which was then called Ceylon. Then on to Singapore and Hong Kong. From Hong Kong, the route took her to Yokohama in Japan, and then across the Pacific Ocean to San Francisco in California. But from there, she still had 3,000 miles of train travel across the country to get back to New Jersey. Shamis, what were some of the highlights? Probably the thing she enjoyed most was meeting Jules Verne and his wife in France. They took her to their home, and she saw his study, where he wrote around the world in 80 days. No wonder Jules Verne was nice to Nellie. Her trip made his book popular again after 15 years. There was even a play produced in Paris. Jules Verne liked Nellie Bly, and he wished her success. As far as highlights go, they weren't all so positive. In Hong Kong, on her 39th day, Nellie found out that she had competition. Another woman, Elizabeth Bisland, sponsored by Cosmopolitan magazine, took off from New York right after Nellie left. Elizabeth Bisland was going the other way, and she had gone through Hong Kong three days before, headed for Singapore, where Nellie had just been. Nellie was shocked. No one had told her. All she could say was, I'm not racing with anyone. My goal is to go around the world in 75 days. If someone wants to do the trip in less time, that's their concern. But you know she must have been furious. She had to wait five days for her ship to Yokohama. While she was in the Far East, she got a little monkey. 
so she would have a traveling companion. She named him McGinley. All this time, people back in the United States were betting on when Nellie would get back to New Jersey. The newspaper included a form for people to write down the exact day, hour, minute, even second when she would return. More than 100,000 forms had been sent in. The newspaper was selling more daily copies than it had sold in a long, long time. Even the senators and congressmen in Washington, D.C. were entering the contest. The first prize was a free trip to Europe. Nellie got to San Francisco on January 22nd, and she still had to cross the United States. And since it was winter, many of the railroad lines were snowed under. She had to go south, from San Francisco to Mojave, California, and then on to New Mexico, before she could go north to Chicago and east to New York. She pulled into Jersey City at 3.15 on the afternoon of Saturday, January 25th, 1890. It had taken exactly 72 days, 6 hours, 11 minutes, and 14 seconds. 116 people had guessed within 15 seconds of the actual time, and someone named F.W. Stevens of New York City guessed within a second of the exact time. What did her trip really prove, Duane? I think the most important thing she proved was that people who succeed are people who stick with it. She must have been tempted many times to relax during the trip. She also proved that a single woman could travel alone safely in most parts of the world. And Shamise, what would you say was the biggest contribution Nellie Bly made to America? It's hard to say, because she went on to do many other things, including reporting on the First World War from Austria, and in later life, writing about and even financially supporting many orphaned and handicapped children. I think her biggest contribution was tearing down barriers women faced in the professional world, showing that women not only had the right, but also the talent and the desire to make careers and names for themselves. There are several good books about Nellie Bly. Two that I would recommend are Nellie Bly by Brooke Kroger and Stop the Presses, Nellie's Got a Scoop by Robert Quackenbush. Nellie Bly really changed newspapers from news stories that were by men for men to news stories that were really for everybody. We'll see you next time.